faults are important components in sedimentary basins? And can we parameterize how faults behave and therefore assess the probability that these faults seal or transmit fluids? This is clearly really important for assessing the performance of subsurface reservoirs for hydrocarbons and the integrity of seals, but they're also really important for assessing the integrity of subsurface geostorage sites for CO2 or even nuclear waste. So can we forecast the characteristics of fault zones in the subsurface? How can we parameterize their characteristics? Well, let's start off by looking at an outcrop. There's a clay-rich layer in black that's been smeared into the fault zone, but other parts of the fault in here comprise uh, gouges, those are cataclased broken rocks derived from the surrounding sandstones. So we've got two distinct types of fault rock in our fault zones. And the importance of this is that for the gouge, in general, we can assume that these will be able to transmit fluids very readily. They may even have an enhanced transmissibility compared to the surrounding original sandstones. Whereas the clay rich layer will tend to inhibit transmission across the fault zone, decreasing its permeability. So let's look at a couple of ways in which we may be able to parameterize these behaviors. So we can start off looking at a very simple idea of clay or shale smear. So let's just consider the behavior on the left there. So as we move the hanging wall down, the clay layer smears out into the fault zone. So let's continue the displacement and we can see that smearing continues like this. But eventually that shale layer going into the fault zone is like to become attenuated out and breached. So we expect there to be a relationship between the throw on the fault or its displacement and the thickness of the clay layer as to whether that clay layer in the fault zone remains intact or not. Let's just examine this qualitatively in outcrop again. Here's a nice outcrop from New Zealand which shows a fault zone like this and we can zoom in and see that there's fault gouge and shale or clay smear just along the fault in that dark um, streaky material but the shale smear is not continuous along the fault zone here it's been breached. So let's move back to our hypothetical cartoons and go back to another one where we have a thicker clay layer. And as we fault this one down, the clay or shale has a greater chance of remaining continuous as the shearing and faulting continues. So the clay layer is entrained but remains intact. So let's compare our two situations in our model, the throws the displacement in our fault zones was the same, but the thinner clay layer was breached, whereas the thicker clay layer thinning out but remained intact. What we can do is parameterize this with the shale smear factor, which will depend on the thickness of the original clay or shale layer and the throw on the fault. And it's parameterized like this. It's the throw divided by the clay layer thickness. So consider a point on the fault, measure the clay layer thickness, Z, the throw, and that allows us to estimate the shale smear factor. So it's a really simple calculation to perform. The thicker the clay, or the smaller the throw, the smaller the shale smear factor. Parameterization in sedimentary basins suggests that values of less than four for shale smear factor suggest that the smear is like to be continuous so that fluid transmissibility across the fault zone will be impeded. The shale smear factor works really well for single shale layers but most sedimentary successions of course have got multiple shale or clay layers within them such as here. So how do we deal with multi layers? Well this is where an alternative parameterization comes in, the shale gouge ratio. Let's see how this might play out. So here is our fault zone here splitting apart and the purple shale units moving down across the foot wall here. So the fault zone is entrained in this case three distinct shale layers. So let's imagine this point of interest. 
we've got our three shale layers, Z1, 2 and 3, that are moved past that point on the fault. So let's just look at the history of shale passage across that point. So what I've done here is plot up the total amount of shale that will go past that point as the throw increases um, along the uh, bottom axis there. So let's see how the throw accumulates. Starts off with no throw, no shale past that point yet. The throw increasing, but still no shale arrived. Here comes some shale. And then the throw increases. The next shale arrives and keeps coming past the fault keeps coming past that point of reference like this to this point here the next shale arrives and then eventually no more shale arriving so that's the history of the passage of shale past that particular point in the football to the fault but that's not forecasting the fault rock but increasing throw makes breaches more likely so we need to be able to build that breaching behaviour into the graph on the right. And this is where shell gouge ratio comes in. So the shell gouge ratio is sigma z divided by the throw of the fault times 100 to get it into a percentage. And sigma z is the sum of the thicknesses of the shale that have passed that point on the fault. So it applies to a single point on the fault plane. So there's the total throw. Here are the shale thicknesses that by the time we accumulate all our throw, these are the ones that will have gone past that point on the fault. So let's see again how this history builds up. So we'll now plot the history of the shale gouge ratio as we allow this fault to displace. So no displacement, no shale gouge ratio yet. Still no shale to arrive. But now the first shale arrives and the shale gouge ratio goes right up here because the throw is rather low still. Okay, the shale is juxtaposed. Let's keep going. But the throw is increasing. No more shale is yet to arrive, so our shale gouge ratio is dropping. But then as the next shale arrives, it begins to climb again. But the, remember, the throw is still going up, so the shale gouge ratio is not increasing that quickly. Indeed, the throw is outcompeting the shale thickness as it arrives. So this is our history of shale gouge ratio. And it shows how sensitive it is to the throw. The more shale that arrives, the higher the SGR. But the more throw there is, this reduces the SGR because the shale is more likely to be breached and entrained out. So for a shale gouge ratio, we need to know the stratigraphic section and we know, need to know what part of that section has passed a particular point on the fault. And we need to know the throw. So there may be uncertainties in both of these values in reality. The SGR has a binary view of stratigraphy, just sandstone or shale. And it assumes that the proportions of these units that we see in the wall rock are incorporated in those proportions into the fault zone. It also assumes, of course, that the fault is a single strand. And these assumptions also apply to the shale smear factor. These are different algorithms, they're different approaches, and there are others as well that have been developed over the years to forecast the composition of fault rocks in sedimentary basins. There may be uncertainties associated with these different approaches, but it still remains fundamentally important if we want to understand fluid migration in sedimentary basins to be able to make these forecasts, and then, of course, to go on and test them against real-world data.